welcome to this uh, first breakout session um, of the FSC conference uh, Growing 2022. My name's David Bishop. I've been at the FSC now for nearly five years, which is kind of crazy when you look back at what, what we've experienced over those last five years. Um, and this session really is here focusing on professional advice um, and how we unlock this consumer demand through growth and transformation. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we're going to say use the app, but don't. Uh, my lovely assistant, Carissa, here will uh, wander around with a microphone. Just make sure you speak into the microphone because we're recording the session. It will just pick everything up. Cool. So um, let's get cracking. Um, rather than give a whole kind of introduction to everybody, I was just going to ask the panelists to give a couple of minutes a uh, brief introduction to themselves uh, and then. Um, Perhaps just tell us a bit about why they're interested in, in this particular topic. So, Craig, I'll go all the way down to the end and start with you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming after lunch. Hopefully it's not too much of a hard session. So, Craig Mulholland, um, I run Apex Advice Group, and our focus is to provide full-service financial advisory to our clients from mortgages through to investments, which includes KiwiSaver, through to insurance. And, you know, one of our key things is to provide that intergenerational advice. So at every stage of your life cycle or life stage, um, we can help you provide a service, whether it's increased cover, reduced cover, et cetera, et cetera. So um, hence the interest today. Cool. Thanks, Craig. Tim. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Buckinas. I am Head of Sales and Account Management at Previra Solutions in New Zealand. Um, so we're an organisation that operates in, um, across eight countries and support our customers in the fintech space. Um, across a range of products, predominantly um, core registry and um, uh, administration systems, moving through into digital engagement and advisor tools as well. Uh, so um, my history, I've been in financial services now for about 18 years, um, variety of roles, client facing, moving into advice technology and now uh, B2B technology. Um, so I've seen the power that technology um, can bring to uh, a financial organisation. On a personal note, um, married, one child, one on the way. Um, no applause, I, I understand that, those are your kids. And um, currently looking to sell a house, um, and so some of you would argue that I'm an excellent candidate for financial advice at this time, trying to sell in the current property climate. Um, but um, also not shy to admit that I've, um, in my earlier years, worked paycheck to paycheck. Um, and so now I've grown beyond that, thinking about retirement, kids' education. So I'm very much a people like me person, and that's why I'm passionate about uh, the panel discussion today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tim. Jonathan, we'll perhaps get some international um, experience from you uh, later on, maybe. Jonathan. Fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm uh, Managing Director of Onimax Software. So uh, what we do as a company is uh, assist in, I like to say, taking the pain out of the advice process. So um, uh, one key thing in terms of delivering advice is efficiencies in the process. So, for example, if you're offering KiwiSaver advice, you can do it really efficiency, efficiently. And so over the years, we've been around for 20 years now, um, we've um, got a whole lot of tools in our, you know, in our platform which we use to uh, assist companies in streamlining that process. So we do uh, KiwiSaver, investment, also mortgage and insurance as well. So, but a big focus for us at the moment has been um, KiwiSaver and investment. So for example, uh, we uh, have clients like from the likes of banks who use our tools uh, to have great customer conversations around KiwiSaver, right to, to smaller uh, groups who use our off-the-shelf solutions to automate the KiwiSaver process. So that includes engaging with the client uh, remotely and also building the advice, whether that is uh, you know, fully robotized or, or not, and then getting them to sign off on that advice. So the reason I'm interested in this is I fundamentally believe that we've got to address the issue of uh, you know, getting this advice process really streamlined if we're going to increase our reach and reach um, all the consumers. Oh, thank you, Ange. Hi hey everybody, uh, I'm Ange, I'm the CEO of Flint Wealth, we're a New Zealand based uh, investment platform. Uh, we service into uh, direct to consumer and uh, B2B. I uh, have been in financial services for about 10 years now, leading change and transformation. And in the last, let's say, five years, I've really specialised in sort of digital uh, startup environments and DIY. 
Um, as a sort of a change leader, I'm really passionate about consumer and transformation. And, uh, and, I, and I'm also a, a mum and a life coach. And, uh, you know, with that, I'm very passionate about um, sort of overlaying everything that I do and the businesses that, uh, that I work in with that sort of like the, the human factor. And, um, and so this topic today, it's, it's all about people. I, I love uh, exploring the psychology behind uh, what we do why people think, act and feel the way they do and all of that has you know, synergies with what we're talking about today. So thank you for inviting me. Great, thank you. Lovely to have you here. Cool, thank you. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because when we start unpacking this, it's not just about um, the digital solutions. It's also about what's happening in the face-to-face -face environment with advice and you know, advisors tend to give much more than just financial advice, I guess, to your life coaching sort of side. You know, they tend to, tend to be a lot wider. So it would be interesting as we delve into the panel to kind of see whether there's a juxtaposition there uh, between digital and uh, the face-to-face -face stuff. I mean, and just to sort of set the scene, I guess, you know, um, the, the, the trends are quite, quite, quite worryingly low, as all you will know in this room, 20% of New Zealanders take advice. So there's a huge opportunity uh, in this market uh, for us to um, understand where the reach is, to your point, Jonathan, and, and where the customer demand is. Um, and I guess, you know, that other point around the tech, tech side about how we can um, start using tech to, to actually deliver these services or use tech more efficiently to deliver these services. So cool. With that, um, the first question um, when we were prepping for this panel, I think Jonathan, you, you said, uh, or maybe it was Tim, you know, what, but we, we use the term robo advice a lot, but it feels like robo advice could mean lots of different things to lots of different people. So I guess um, the first question, um, Tim, uh, what does robo advice mean to you? Um, and then we'll uh, go along the panel. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, if you talk to 10 different people about robo-advice, you get 15 different views. Um, so, but there is a common consensus and a common theme, and that seems to be that robo-advice is a um, more simple suite of um, calculators um, in the investment space, so more focused on investment engines and calculators and rebalancing. Uh, not as personalised, in most cases more general advice, uh, and often unaccompanied by uh, formal advice documentation and recommendation. Uh, what I think is robo-advice is it's a precursor to what is now emerging as a more sophisticated digital advice uh, mechanism which allows you to uh, provide personalised advice at scale uh, and um, across a variety of topics. So that covers investment and insurance and retirement accumulation and lending. Uh, so um, the advantage, I think, of digital advice is it brings um, a, an engaging digital customer experience um, to the organisation. Um, it allows organisations um, to offer consistent and accurate advice. Um, but uh, most importantly, I think, when it comes to digital or robo, is um, bringing the assistance of a human advisor when the requirements get too complex um, or too emotional. And my example there is um, several years ago when um, digital advice wasn't really a thing, I engaged with a robo-advisor and I told the thing, hey, I want to buy a new motorcycle. Can I, can I achieve my retirement goals if I buy that particular bike? Um, and computer said no. And so, sad face, that was me walking away. But I've since engaged with a financial advisor and that financial advisor was able to coach me and help me understand some of the other um, levers that I could pull to help me um, achieve my long-term objectives but also um, get the, the short-term satisfaction of the motorcycle as well. And I think that's a, a common misconception, is that uh, digital advisors replace human advisors. Uh, but I, I think um, you know, there's multiple research reports out there that speak to the value of human advisors, and that is not in the products that you recommend, but in the behavioural coaching um, and the guidance uh, side of things. Um, in terms of um, uh, unlocking demand, uh, I think digital advice um, removes or lowers the barriers to entry to advice for consumers. Um, it makes advice more affordable to provide and receive. Uh, it's easier, um, and certainly for busy working professionals who don't have time during their day to meet with a financial advisor, so I can do that in the 24-7 context. But also, I think importantly, is empowerment, um, giving those consumers that want to have a bit of a play around and dabble with their own financial future, the tools to be able to do so and get that sense of empowerment in the direction of their financial future. Great, thanks. And Craig, just from your perspective of managing you know, an advice, uh, an advice 
group. I, it was your view on the robo advice and, and the sort of the balance between where robo advice and face to face advice works. And that's a really challenging question because every consumer is different. And so the key thing when we look at right across your client base, <coughs> excuse me, you know, everyone has a different need. And you know, what is robo to them? So some, even just going on to a, a banking app or a basic app, you know, they'll think that's robo versus you know, early, your early adopters would have something really, really complicated and with you know, good AI sitting behind it. And so therefore, as a provider of service, you go, well, actually, where should we be investing? Should we be investing more in our people to get in front of, of clients? Or should we be investing more in you know, some of these more complicated algorithms and you know, the needs base? So you've really got to go back and assess you know, what is our client base and what do they need? You know, our personal um, experience, and you know, COVID has had a massive impact on this, is if you go back to 2019 and you think about the more complex products like insurance and the like, you know, most people would expect an advisor to come to them or them to come to um, the advisor's office and have that conversation. And you know, with COVID, that didn't happen. And so we look right across the spectrum of you know, you know, young people, millennials, right through to your 60 and 70 year olds. Most of them now are really comfortable with you know, using Zoom or Teams as a mechanism to do it, or even just the telephone. So, you know, therefore you say, well, what is Robo and what do our clients like? And I think it's early steps. Um, the stat is only about 20% of our, um, our nation take advice. And so I think it's about small steps. And so I think it's about, you know, investing where you need to and providing the form of technology that your clients are capable with. Um, and, you know, it depends on the size of your business as well. Can you afford to build out a portal? Does that really matter? Can you use other people's portals? Um, and so, yeah, I don't think there's any one answer other than to step back and say, you know, what do our clients need? What's the best way? But I think, you know, when you get you know, early adopters and when you get younger people, you know, they're going to love using apps and a smart way to do things. As their needs get more complex, they're going to need to talk to an advisor and you've got to work out what's the most appropriate method for that, um, whether it is you know, the face-to-face, -face, the Zoom. Um, but. Yeah, I think COVID has been a game changer around people's willingness to even just have online services. So I think as a nation we're very slow to adopt financial advice um, as, you know, and the importance of that and then sitting behind that um, as even there's fewer people willing to accept robo advice or some form of digital advice at this point in time and that's one of our big challenges um, as providers um, and as an industry. Well, thanks, Greg. And Ange, just um, coming back to that, um, the idea of younger people accessing um, accessing investment platforms and robo advice. You know, in terms of your experience, you know, is this just a trend, or is it just a fad, or is it something that, that, that that's here to stay? Um, well, it's certainly more than a trend. <laughs> um, and look, there were plenty of there's plenty of articles and stats out there that you know show the uptake of um, digital platforms well before COVID. COVID, as you'll know, just accelerated uh, things in general. And so, um, but what I did find interesting uh, through that COVID experience is that we, as consumers, we were already very much used to researching, you know, being online before we engaged in, you know, purchasing products or services. And what um, COVID did is it changed the game, really. It really made... Um, one day uh, a reality and just to explain that many of us were would say you know, look we'll deal with this we'll research that when we've got more time at some point uh, we'll look into this a little bit more I might review my insurances I might see what else is out there but all these are big asks and I need more time to do it and then all of a sudden through COVID <coughs> there was time to do it mm. and uh, as a result of that what consumers found is that um, with more time up their sleeve, with more freedom to just be able to research, they were able to learn more. And through learning more, they were able to discover solutions to problems they didn't even necessarily knew they had. Um, they found alternatives, they found better deals, and actually, you know, with that education increase came a sense of confidence and empowerment. And uh, you know we know about human beings when we feel those good feelings. This is, we want to keep them. So I don't think there's um, any intention. Uh, uh, there's any possibility that we'll go backwards. I think um, we'll see more demand uh, for tools and resources that will enable and empower. 
and um, we, you know we're already seeing quite a bit of distraction with customer switching um, and, and until we really get our businesses in a state that you know it is providing the level of um, information and resources and tools that uh, consumers are demanding um, that will continue but it will certainly slow down as we you know start to catch up to what their expectations are Interesting. and Jonathan I mean um, obviously there was life before COVID and we talk about COVID accelerating um, all this change which which um, which is interesting but you know have other tools and other technologies and other digital solutions had a real impact on on what we're seeing now more people accessing uh, advice accessing um, robo advice and the technology impacts of the new tools that are, that are out there I think it's a bit of both and I mean what COVID did was normalize the sort of remote interaction and I guess um, before COVID I always went to see my doctor now I don't mind having a Zoom visit. I'm trying to get one with my dentist. It's not working yet. But there's an expectation now of online interaction. So these tools have been around for a long time. Actually a lot of the technology has been around for a long time. So what we found as a company who automates this, um, suddenly something which was like item five on the agenda came to item one. And uh, we were like, they're like, oh, hang on. You know, we were going to replace this paper fact find. Now we really, really need to do that. And uh, the importance of authorization and sign off and all these things. So it's actually, it came at a quite a good time in the sense the technology baseline was there. And uh, what we were able to do as a technology company is actually just actually bring it all together for people so they could actually interact. You know, technology such as Zoom replace the whole in office meeting mm -hmm. if needed. And then the big thing which has come is actually the authorization. You know, the, the old application forms, eh? They <laughs> don't particularly work well remote, but the ability to authorize. Um, so the technology is out there and it's come at the right time. So yes, there have been some, some new innovations, but I think it's really been on the back of what has already been uh, established. And um, I, I know as a technology person, I love when things happen to implement change um, uh, because we've seen people make some radical transformations in their business. And also I think the consumer model is really set for more digital interaction. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'd just like to talk about the economics of advice and as, as an advice provider. So, you know, pre-COVID, when you had advisors driving two clients to provide advice, that was really inefficient. We've got a value for money conversations, we've got margin squeeze, we've got greater obligations for the new regulations. So, if you look at it without a digital solution, then you're saying, actually, our industry was, you know, at some point in time going to become uneconomic to continue to provide advice on a face-to-face -face basis. But then you flip over and go, what is the cost of technology? How big is my business? And so you'd think that the larger your scale, the easier it is to adopt digital solutions, you know, bring in the likes of Bibera, Onumax, um, you know, Flint, etc. But you know, for a lot of businesses, the cost of digitising robo, whatever that may be, is really, really significant. So you've got to say, well, actually, what's the inflection point between face-to-face -face Zoom calls engagement versus going to a technology <coughs> solution? And you know, in the market, my personal view is there's not a white label solution out there that most of those advisors who are in transitional phase can actually go and say, I'll buy that, that will help me engage with the client, you know, get my scope of engagement, provide advice, document my statement of advice, and then put it out to the market. So, you know, I think it's, you know, for the big end of town, they've got legacy systems, it's going to be tough, but they've got the budgets to change. For the small end of town with individual advisors or small groups, you know, really want and need to use digital capability, um, but there's no single solution out there that I've seen in the market. And so I think there's some huge challenges in the industry around just the pure economics of how do you make it work. And uh, you know, we're hoping that you know, being in the middle is about right because you've got the scale to invest in technology, but you've also got the ability to still do your face-to-face -face when you need it. But you know, again, like I said earlier, there's no right solution, but you know, as an industry we need to figure out you know, is there a way in which we can keep as many advisors in the market as possible mm. with services or providing services in the way that our consumers want. Mm. 
That's interesting, and, and I guess it, it comes down to that balance of digital versus face to face, and, and who needs who needs who needs which elements when, uh, which is really cool. I guess, um, and it, your your comment leads on quite nicely to this idea of reach in the market, right? So if we've only got 20% of Kiwis, I think it's less in Australia of, of taking up advice. Um, how do we how do we start building? How do we start reaching out and driving demand um, more? In, uh, for within the within the advice market for Kiwis, I, I guess Tim, if I threw that over to you. Yeah, it's, uh, and I agree. I agree what you say, Craig. Um, mm. I, I think digital the digital um, solution um, isn't the the, the catch-all solution. Um, I think I think what we would see um, across the the consumer. Demographics um, are those that um, are delegators that would prefer just to offload advice to a to a professional advisor, um, and then we would see um, technology play a greater role in those that are more DIY and have the um, aptitude and the desire to go online and do a little bit of homework and, and, and research. Look, I think um, there are some challenges and some barriers to um, to to um, getting the, the Kiwis um, engaged with advice. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we've spoken to, to a few of these already. There are cost pressures, there are regulatory pressures from an advisor side of things. Um, ad advisor numbers aren't growing. Uh, and in fact, in Australia, we're seeing advisor numbers declining. So the supply of professional advice is, is, um, is dropping. Um, but I think it's important to define um, what do we mean by seeking advice? Um, and I would go one step further to say yeah, we should really be defining this as seeking professional advice. Um, we are hearing uh, individuals and consumers holding financial advice discussions with family and friends. Uh, at barbecues I hold, um, we often talk about, hey, what are you doing? You know, how are you doing? Why are you, why, you, know, why are you so successful? Um, and it shows, goes to show how um, interesting my barbecues are when we talk about financial <laughs> uh, advice. Um, but we've also got this other um, unique aspect, which is this rise of this Finfluencer concept. So these individuals that are on social media um, and with huge followings of consumers, and they're talking about you know these 20-somethings with a Ferrari in the garage, and some of them come up with pretty far-out strategies on how they acquired their wealth. Let's invest in options and futures. And you know, by the way, um, here's a 15% discount code for my trading platform. Um, so um, you know, and there's, there's challenges there. We see ASIC in Australia are, are clamping down on that, and they're saying, hey guys, you're actually providing financial advice without the appropriate qualifications and licensing, and so on. So I don't think it's a question of um, consumers aren't seeking financial advice. I think it's a challenge of consumers seeking professional financial advice. Mm. Um, and the challenges are there. I mean, you know, we've heard the, um, the, the cost challenge. There's a perception that financial advice is for the wealthy and it costs a whole bunch. Um, we, uh, we see that um, there is a lack of understanding on financial products and their intended purpose. Um, FSC have released a number of excellent reports that um, really show a disconnect between consumer expectation and reality. Um, half of us don't understand what it require, what it takes to save into a financial product to achieve the um, retirement outcomes that we desire, for example. Um, so I think, for me, um, it's, it's the education. It's trying to get out there and promote um, the, the value of financial advice and educate these um, consumers that financial advice doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it doesn't have to be a suit and tie in an office. It doesn't have to be online and digital, um, but there is value um, and, and, and getting those uh, consumers in front of an advisor um, or an advisor tool to help them understand what the outcome looks like. Yeah, interesting. Any other comments on like, how we could develop reach in, in this space and get more people in the advice, um, in the advice uh, process, whether digital or face-to-face? -face? Possibly more just comment on um, getting more advisors in the market so with an ageing advisor base you know, a lot of them you know, who won't be requalifying will exit come March next year. Yeah. Um, Massey does a course but you know, I'm really passionate about not only financial literacy generally for the, the country but you know, we should have our universities focusing on um, financial advice, financial planning style degrees. So you can train to be an accountant, you can train in finance, you can train in all these other commerce, marketing, etc. We should be really focusing on getting more financial advisors into the industry. And then your, your question, David, about, about the reach, that's really challenging. Um, but you know, I think it's you can go out there with above the line marketing to try and get people in. We've got lots of providers out there trying to promote their products and all that's really, really fantastic. Um, but I think, you know, 
viral um, is so powerful. You know, you advise one client, you advise them really well, they refer you to their friends, you help their friends, you help their friends. And if you're in, everyone in the industry is doing that and abiding by the regulations, providing really good advice, doing true, true needs-based analysis um, rather than product pushing, then I think more people are willing to take up advice and particularly when people say, it didn't cost me anything um, and I've got this advice and now I feel much more comfortable and I think a lot of the FSC um, you know, sort of surveys have shown that you know when people take financial advice, they feel much better about and have much more peace of mind. So. Yeah, if they tell that to their friends through the barbecue conversation, um, then that, that's really, really powerful. But there's there's no silver bullet. Um, mm. But I think, yeah, if we get it right as an industry and provide good advice every time and our friends tell our friends tell our friends, then, you know, we're well on the way. Interesting. So there's kind of this, uh, there's um, too few advisors, probably a bit of how we get out there. Um, Jonathan, just interested in your view. Um, obviously, an advisor in advisor business has many, many roles to play um, from actually giving the advice to actually managing the advice business. And just wondered what your view is on how we could improve producti productivity through some of these digital solutions. Well, I think the key thing here is that the cost of advice is uh, people generally aren't willing to pay uh, for the advice part of it. And so, um, the conversations that we have with um, with advisors is, oh, why are you doing KiwiSaver advice? Well, it just takes me too long to put it all together, so I just don't touch it. So, um, but if you use technology and you automate the process, it can be done really efficiently. The other anxiety advisors have, you know, all the the regulation. Are they ticking all the boxes in the process? So, what we've typically found is we've come to companies and seen advice processes which. Um, if you do cut and paste, you're not following a process. So um, there's a still a lot of cutting and pasting of templates. There's still a lot of um, uh, systems which produce a statement of advice, but the advisor's then taking that off and doctoring it somewhere else to actually get it to how they want it. And so there's a lot of inefficiencies and time consumed in actually putting that together. So if we're going to extend our reach into the community, we've got to make sure that the process of actually giving advice is super efficient, particularly in the retail area. And so what we do is we work with companies to streamline that process because an advisor can have a much greater reach than they currently do because they're actually limited by um, their processes and systems. So uh, if you can digitize, I like to talk about, you know, not robot advice, but actually can you digitize your process and then you only end up doing you know, 5% of that because the rest can be automated. And then you do the core value bits of the client. So what we, what we do is work with companies basically to extend their reach. And my, my firm belief is that you know, only a few people are actually going to reach out. You really don't know the conversation. You know, everybody needs a conversation about KiwiSaver. But who knows that they actually need that. So it's going to take uh, enabling advisors with the right tools to get out there to have the conversations to give that advice. Interesting. And I think, and if, if we think about that from sort of the bigger, maybe the bigger businesses to the smaller businesses, is, you know, is there businesses? That's a, lots of S's on that one. Um, is there a more... Um, is there a big end versus small end of town conversation going on? Is there a challenge there? Are we seeing a ma major shift to people heading towards more nimble businesses? So in my opinion, what we're seeing is a shift in where the, where the value of advice, that line is changing. <coughs> you know, so I think um, just you know from, from my experience in the and the conversations I've had, um, we really need to be as businesses checking in that the that the value we think we're giving is indeed because we can get caught up in that. You can really get caught up in your 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 own marketing and your and and just your own your own identity and your own um, and your value proposition. You know, it does it does happen. And if you get caught up in that and you fail to see that the market's changing and that your value proposition um, may not be the same uh, with that audience uh, as it was when you started out. So it's really important that we check in, uh, really, you know, 
from a face-to-face -face survey, however you need to do it, check in on your target audiences, your target markets, understand that uh, what truly is the expectation and the value proposition of those audiences now and certainly businesses that uh, are clear on that now and anticipate that that's actually going to change uh, and regularly uh, and and soon and will continue to do so businesses that anticipate that and are prepared for that uh, are going to sort of be more successful and thrive uh, so, uh, you know, I've, I've sparked on heaps uh, over the last two years about um, adaptability and, and making sure that, you know, businesses right from top to bottom through infrastructure, staff, um, that, that we're adaptable and that uh, by becoming more adaptable at, at every level and in every way, then we tune into our markets, we tune into our audiences and, you know, anticipate where they're going and we're adaptable enough to be able to work mm. to work with that so there's so more of an agility kind of kind of approach mm. yeah okay yeah cool just one comment on that david you know i think we still have so few people take financial advice that there's a role for every single platform whether it's a flint a shares there's a hatch or the big end of town with the private banks to every advisor in between because people at different stages of their life are going to want to take advice in different ways there's no way my teenage kids or you know, my friends, you know, kids who are in the 20s, would ever want to go and see a financial advisor no matter how young or old they were. But they love the platforms, they love trading it, but hopefully in time, that will then educate them to go, actually, I've had, had a few wins, probably had more losses than wins through making it up by myself, and now I know I need a bit of help. And so they'll go to the next stage and say, I'd actually like to talk to an advisor and, you know, I only know enough to be dangerous. And I think when you get to the later stages of your career, you say, actually, I'm a really sophisticated investor. I've got financial advice, but I want to have a play. I've got $10,000 I want to play with here. I might put into these shares or these bonds or whatever. So I think right across the industry, there's a role for large and mm. small. Mm. Um, and you know, the more it educates um, our country, the better. Mm. And I think we've seen that you know, in Australia, where yeah, particularly with all the super over there, you know, $3 trillion worth of funds. You, know, you talk to the average man in the outback, they know what money is, you know, as a rule, that they know how much super they've got. Um, they've had the 12% taken out of their income the entire working career. So, um, you know, even though they may not be as sophisticated as the person in the city or whatever about, you know, how they're investing and what they're doing, um, they've got an awareness of it. And I think as our KiwiSaver balances build, that's a brilliant catalyst mm -hmm. for young and old to think more about investing financial advice and then, you know, the whole financial conversation mm -hmm. um, in their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. So if we you know, get to this scenario where we're starting to um, build people's awareness, they're using perhaps more robo advice or advice um, platforms. That comes with risks and risks and challenges in itself. So you know, obviously online um, cyber risks are, are pretty prevalent. And I was reading in the New Zealand Herald, I think earlier in the week, that there was a, they stopped 170,000 cyber attacks just in the last week. Uh, it's kind of crazy figures. So I, I guess, Craig, just sticking with you, you know, with a shift from face-to-face -to, -face to digital or even a combination of the two, you know, what what can advisors do or advisors business do or the industry do to help keep consumers safe? Yeah, and I think it's a matter of awareness and education of your clients, you know, and you know, most places will say, well, you know, we'll always, you know, we, we'll never email you and ask for details, etc. and that's just, just a base level. But, you know, when we're giving advice to clients, you know, we warn them and say, listen, you know, we'll always be in contact with you. But, you know, there are scams going on. If you're ever uncomfortable, ring back. And we have clients we've had for 20 years and they go, you know, they get called once a year to do the reviews and they go, oh, it's a scam call. And, mm. you know, because of privacy, you can't tell them their information that you know about them to convince them. And so one of the mechanisms is to say, well, actually, you know, call our 0800 number that you've got. You don't tell them what it is. Mm. They call in and they immediately get put back through to that advisor. Um, but, you know, there is increasing awareness but it's incumbent upon us to make sure that our clients are aware. Um, but, but the flip side is there is just so much going on. You know, I know I get you know, a couple of scams a day, doesn't matter how much you do your spam filters, yeah, it's there, it's everywhere, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. And there's some absolutely terrible stories out there. And you know, I think your mobile numbers are a great help if, if people have got your contact details, um, they know you personally, and you know, one of the critical things with any client for advice is trust. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you know each other, then that's easy. But yeah, as you get 
organisations get bigger or more online, you know, the, the risk just increases exponentially and there's only so much you can do to educate and protect. Um, at the end of the day, you know, um, accountability sits in different places and when things do go wrong and you hope you've done everything you possibly can to protect your clients, but there's, there's no simple answer. Yeah, and I, I think we need to focus in on that trust piece. I think that's a huge, um, a huge part of um, of the equation, um, especially when it is that you're dealing with your vendors, um, trusting your vendors to make sure that they're doing everything in their power to protect your customers' sensitive information is paramount. I can tell you, working at a financial technology organisation um, that does store and process sensitive customer information, we take that very seriously. And it impacts me deeply because I have to perform X number of audit questionnaires and security checkpoints every month. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite impactful. But for us um, as an organisation, we have entire departments of teams of people whose sole job and responsibility it is to keep track of the latest cyber security threats, um, make sure that there are um, no weaknesses or exploitations in our systems, uh, to ultimately allow the boards and um, managers of our um, organisations, our customers' organisations, to sleep soundly at night and in turn uh, flow on that trust to their customers. Um, it was interesting, uh, about seven or eight years ago um, when um, we were trying to find ways to digitise electronic application forms and that sort of thing in the advice space, I, I came across an advisor who um, had found a PDF, um, editable PDF app um, on the iTunes store and he was saying, hey look what I've done, I've downloaded um, one of the insurance company's application forms, I've used this app to digitise it and look I can type in the customer's information. I was like, oh that's really cool, you know, I can email that away and it's just with the insurer ready for processing. But when you dig a little deeper, that app um, was built by a company headquartered in China who saved that online information in servers based in China. Um, and when we start hearing things like, you know, the recent 50 million Chinese citizen data leak from the um, uh, mandatory health insurance scheme over there recently. Um, that's, a, that's a significant concern. What's even more concerning is that data, that data is cheap. Um, that 50 million um, policyholder information sold for $4,000. So uh, cyber security and the trust in the vendors in which you're engaging with is, is significant. And from your perspective in Flint um, on that cyberspace, um, what's, your, what's your views? Um, I guess my experience of it is around, um, I mean we have people in the business that are far more astute uh, about this than me, but my, um, my, my uptake on it is, you know, rec we recognise that uh, in terms of regulation there is, you know, very surprisingly there's very sort of little to no direct uh, regulation around um, cyber security. There's no um, absolute hard line around what process or technology we should implement. We have uh, the sort of the New Zealand government taking a, an approach which is more um, guide and and support, and so. So you know, a, a lot is really in our hands, right? And so we've got to, uh, and and that means, um, you know, as part of of our responsibilities, like right across the business, we've got to really embed uh, cyber awareness from board level, senior leadership. Uh, we've got to take accountability, like right, just through the operations, we've got to take accountability for you know ourselves. And if we if we don't. Then we're likely to see, you know, the government take a stance of, if, if you, you know, we'll basically trash the whole guide and support and take a police and punishment uh, type of approach. And we uh, obviously that's not where we want to be. And so you know, we've got to be as providers really, really vigilant in terms of making sure that we're taking this really seriously. Um, that you know, cyber security, cyber threats. Are, um, they're only going to get more common and more harmful and so again that can lead to a much stronger stance, stance. and so we've really just got to work together to make sure that we're addressing um, the, you know, the needs of the public, the needs of our people, uh, the needs of our business and so um, yeah, look, there's just not a there's just, just not a one a one thing, but you know, regulators are clear. They expect us to be right on top of 
you know, the, the cyber security and taking all all measures. And so, it's really just you know down to us to work together to to really make a difference in this space because you know one major issue could change it for us all and for all our customers. And I think we really want to be in charge of our our destiny and making sure we're putting fit for purpose, you know, processes and, and securities into our business. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, a different way to sort of sum up exactly what Andrew says is the law is just the baseline. The law is what we had to account, but I don't think that matters at all. Um, it's our reputation. And, you know, we can do all we can to protect people's data, protect how they contact us, and then you send them their advice to a Gmail account, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter how many times you have conversations with the client to say, listen, Gmail is not secure, do you have a more secure platform? No, 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 because they don't want it by post, you don't want to send it by post. So you, know, you can do everything you possibly can, but if, if the client or the customer is not willing to actually have their own secure email address, um, you know, that poses a problem for you as an organisation because you don't know whether it's leaked from your organisation, your providers, from Gmail. Or from their end, so yeah, it's a significant challenge for all of us. But I think it's just you know awareness is, as everyone said, is critical. Uh, there's an interesting uh, question from the floor here around open banking and data sharing, and the question is: Will clients feel comfortable with their financial habits being updated in real time with their advisors? Big question. <laughs> John has been quite for a while. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, I think it, it is very much a generational thing, isn't it? Because I think, um, you know, we're all willing to divulge all of our information on Facebook, uh, that type of thing. Um, but it's quite a different thing, isn't it, to have all that information shared. I think that's yet to be tested. Uh, I think we can have a look into other markets such as the UK. I haven't done research on that, so I can't comment. Is anybody else from here uh, familiar with the uh, consumer attitude from the UK? It's been a few years since I looked at the UK open bank regime, but you know they've talked about bringing it to New Zealand, but but not at, at great pace. Um, I think the uptake in the UK hasn't been nearly as great as what they expected. Um, for us as industry specialists, that's absolutely data we'd love, and we could provide some phenomenal services to our clients if we can get access to that data. Um, but as Jonathan said, it's intergenerational. Um, yeah, anyone under 30 does not care. They expect you to know more about them than they know about themselves because you should just be looking at everything. You should have access to all their data. Um, you know, anyone over sort of 50 probably quite horrified um, that you know this sort of stuff about them. So again, as horses for courses, um, and it'll be really interesting to see how uh, New Zealanders adapt to open banking if, in fact, it ever does to come through. And Jonathan, obviously we've just been focusing there on cyber risks and data risks. What are the challenges and risks do you perceive uh, the financial or professional advice community uh, face? Well, I think one of the key ones is, um, you know, moving to a digital reach. So if you're not doing face-to-face, -face, you're reaching out digitally, then the key thing is just uh, is identity of the person. Um, uh, and it's not even involved. You can have people imitating your identity and they don't need to hack or do anything like that. I think a case in point was we had as an organisation years ago was uh, uh, where someone pretended to be our accountant or the vice versa MD emailed the accountant saying hey I need this money transferred so and so straight away needs to be done. Thankfully that was caught, that was an imitation. Now um, how do you know that your clients emailing you are actually your clients? You might say, oh, of course, it's email, that should be the person, but her email is an insecure means of communication. So I think that is critical moving into this point, and Craig, you brought this up too, is that there needs to be security and communication, and um, what we advise is there needs to be a digital portal where you have communications. This is what the banks do. They don't email you directly, they'll have a, a secure communication channel and uh, where all authorizations are done and they're, they're multi-factor in the sense of they're authorized by another form like a, a text message or so on. So I think um, one of the dangers is, is adding on the digital bit on top of the existing business model. You've got to be aware that you have to change the way that you validate. You, you can't validate a, a customer's identity just by seeing them. Uh, so biometric, um, where they hold up their you know, driver's license, get their face scanned, all that kind of stuff. So you know that you're actually dealing with the, the actual person. So I think, I mean, those, that's uh, an obvious risk in terms of increasing our reach. 
I think as all businesses, we, we need to be doing basic security checks because, uh, you know, um, it's quite easy to see when you've left the front door open, but you might not be aware of it. So quite quickly, you can identify where you've just got a, a quite an open security risk. Now, as a technology company, we need to go, we dive deep in all of this stuff and do it on a regular basis. But it's something which we all have to address in a digital age. Hmm. Interesting. And another question from the floor, actually, that comes back into this, um, the non, uh, questions of non-monetary um, banks and values and, and, and the influence of that on financial decisions. And the question is, um, how do you see um, sort of the, the, this is a growth area and what data or information do you think that advisors need to have better conversations out, out with the kind of financial conversations? So in terms of open data? I think so, yep. 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 Oh, absolutely. I mean, advice is reliant on good data. Mm. And um, now whether the, uh, the client wants that disclosed or not is a, is a different matter, because um, usually disclosure of data increases in terms of trust. Uh, so, but the more information that you have, the better advice that you can give. So from a, a perspective of a financial advisor, having this open data uh, is, in, is incredible um, uh, in terms of what you can actually do and, and service. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. If you look at it from the sort of psychological aspect that um, as you talked about before, you know, one way of being really efficient is to send a questionnaire to the client. So you, you gain their trust initially, you send them a questionnaire, they do almost their entire fact find for you by completing all the data and then they send it back to you. Now a lot of clients aren't willing to do that, but when they do, that actually means they really want the advice, which means that the advisor spends a lot less time with them because they've got complete information and it's a much quicker <coughs> process. And because that client's had to go through and spend quite a bit of time pulling together financial information for you, they're really vested in the process. You know, they've spent sometimes one, two, three hours getting that and it makes for a really, really powerful advice conversation where you can look at more than just, I need insurance or I need a mortgage. You look at the totality of, of their life, their assets and what they need to do. So, um, but again, you've got to get that information mm. to and from them by secure means. And, and Jonathan, you, you talk about portals and then we think about regulation. So you've got a portal. How do you know that actually your you know, client was the one that went to their portal? Was it, you know, they, they're a bit older, they, got, they couldn't figure it out, so they got someone to help them. And then did their, you know, their son or daughter click I've read this. How can you prove that they've actually read the advice on the portal? Because in two, three, four years' time, when something goes wrong, you know they're going to say, "Well, actually, you know, you, ne you never gave me that advice." We've said, "Well, yes, we didn't send it to you, but it's in the portal." So I think, you know, all these sorts of things around digital technology. There's all these sort of practical things when you think about the law and giving good advice that you know you have to think about. But coming back to the, the, the question, um, if you can get your clients to do a whole lot of the work early on, um, they get really vested in the process. Mm -hmm. So it actually qualifies out. Uh, sometimes you know quite a number of clients which there could be really good opportunity to help um, but it does mean they're, they're very engaged. Mm. Interesting. Um, there's another question as well from the floor here, uh, another big question I'd say. Um, the, the biggest risk, uh, what do you think the biggest risk is in the future? Um, maybe Tim will put this one to you. Is it um, identity fraud or cyber hacking of data <coughs> is your view? So identity, identity fraud or cyber hacking of data, it's a big question. <laughs> I think um, I think the two the two are almost um, almost the same. Mm. I think they pose the same sort of risk, mm. um, and that's why we're seeing the emergence of um, identity management um, tech firms coming into the market to try and alleviate that and ensure that the people that you're dealing with are indeed mm. the people that you're dealing mm. with. Um, you know, we are seeing technology start to mature in that space. You know, we're, we're you know we're speaking about online portals and, and validation of advice. Um, you know. <laughs> How far do you take it? You could say the same with a written contract. Hey, mum, dad, I don't understand what I'm signing. Can you read it and, and sign it? Or not sign it for me, but can you help me read it and understand it? So I think I think um, you know there's there's a limit to how far you can take it. But um, you know if we look at technology, um, the multi-factor authentication that you, Jonathan, spoke of goes a long way. Where we um, not only need a username and password, for example, to log on to a portal, but a second form of identification that um, is. Um, tested by the courts of law as being beyond a reasonable doubt um, and identify 
that that is you. Um, so a text message to your registered mobile cell phone, um, or is it a, a, a code to an app? Um, you know, I see a lot of the banks are starting to do that now. We log on on the internet, and then you need to open up their online uh, their, their uh, bank app to click a code. Apple was starting to do it, or have done it for some time. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, village vigilance um, in identity management um, and cyber hacking. It does come down to um, the technology um, that is being employed and ensuring, again coming back to the trust in your vendors, to make sure that those vendors have the protections in place and the tools that they need uh, to be able to validate that. Can I be controversial? Of course, please do. Why isn't the government solving this for us? You know, AML is the bane of everyone's life, it's the bane of clients' life. You go to your lawyer, you have to do AML. You go to your real estate agent, you have to do AML. You come to your advisor, you have to do AML. You know, the US has got social security numbers. Why aren't we in New Zealand using Realme or some other centralised platform with, you know, you know, all the cyber spooks that managing it, monitoring it, controlling it, you know, and I don't know where the answer is because successive governments, you know, think there'd be an invasion of um, people's privacy, but all your data's out there anyway. Mm. You know, I think there's a really good way to, to solve this at a central government level where everyone having a unique identifier, we've already got ID numbers, so why couldn't that be a form um, but, you know, if you ask every advisor about AML and <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. Cool, interesting. Hey, we're nearly at the end of the session. Unfortunately, a really interesting discussion. I, it'd be really good just to hear from you all in turn, maybe because uh, you've got the microphone. Craig, we'll start with you. Just um, a couple of questions. One, um, is this a transformative moment in time, an evolution or a revolution for professional advice? And also, where do you see professional advice being in the next sort of five years? Yeah, I think it's always an evolution, not a revolution. Um, I think one of the most critical things is increased awareness right across the sector with end-to-end you know, -end digital capability. And that's so the clients and customers can self-serve when they want, how they want, um, with access to advisors when they want, and digital capability for you know, all service providers in the market right through to you know, the manufacturers, um, all digital end-to-end. -end, and I think that's a really great client outcome and it'll make the industry sufficiently efficient uh, for everyone to stay in business, uh, notwithstanding the uh, the margin squeeze that's going on at present. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I, you know, I would go as far as to say that financial services as an industry is starting to undertake a transformation. Um, certainly some of the work that we're doing with customers overseas is starting um, to yield um, digital first operating models. So not only the introduction of technology to create efficiency, but overhauling the entire organisation to um, automate or digitise, commoditise processes and the low value stuff to try and focus the human energy, um, what you're paying advisors for, the, the value add, uh, into, into those um, discussions for moments that matter for customers. So I think we're, we're starting to get into a bit of a transformation conversation. Um, in terms of my vision um, for financial services in five years, uh, hey Siri, am I over budget? <laughs> Your team. That's what you told me anyway. My vision is that she'll be able to answer that question for me. Uh, and so, um, you know, if we could take some of the um, concepts that have been discussed today, um, the convergence of technology and financial services to bring that information into everyday moments that matter and my daily activity. So being able to um, ask my smartphone, hey, I want to buy that motorcycle, is that going to put me out of whack with my goals and objectives? Um, uh, and I also see um, the open banking, if it does take off, evolve into organisations being able to have more meaningful conversations by leveraging that data. So provided that consumers um, accept the data sharing that comes with open banking, um, you know, how great would it be for me as a parent going into a second child for my advisor to give me a call and say, hey Tim, I've just noticed that you've got maternity payments coming into your bank account. Is it now time to review your insurances? Should we be revisiting your savings plan? Um, so that's what I see in the next five years. Just need to get me one of those watches then, I, Jonathan. Well, I very much see it as a transformative time in terms of the experience that I'm seeing in organisations as they actually are doing quite a deep dive uh, right to the core in terms of what this FAP licensing is going to mean. There is a, it really is like what you're saying, Tim, they're, they're addressing things right to the core because actually you can't just paste technology on the outside of a business, you actually got to go right from the, the centre. Um, so I think it's quite an exciting time. I think the, the open uh, API is going to really disrupt the market in terms of data. 
and uh, you know the uh, a consumer is going to be able to aggregate that data um, rather than going to a provider they'll be able to have a view of information so um, uh, uh, so that's going to be very interesting in the advice area what's going to happen who knows uh, I'm a bit of a futurist I like to think about where that's going to land um, so but my my vision really is I would like to see um, I guess the reach um, of advice to more Kiwis I would like to see that they're like every single financial professional can give good KiwiSaver advice, have a good KiwiSaver conversation, and even more than that. Because again, you don't know what you don't know. And a conversation in your early 20s around this can make all of the difference. So I would like to see the advice industry have that greater reach um, to make a difference um, in the community. Cool. And the last word, Ange. Cheers. So I'm fully on board, I fully agree with what you're all saying. Um, I think that, uh, so t to overly share, um, I'm dyslexic and so my strength with that is that I um, see patterns of behaviour and, and patterns, commercial patterns and changes in patterns and uh, how those patterns, what, what they lead into. And um, you know, my, my feel, my opinion is that actually uh, this sector is going to get turned on its head. There's all of this change is almost sort of really expected. It has been accelerated, but it is expected. But I think there's bigger change to come yet. Um, I think we've yet to experience our sort of uh, Amazon, B and B, Airbnb, you know, Netflix uh, mm. moment, and that's in the near future. I wish I could tell you exactly what it was. <laughs> point. But um, but yeah, I think that it will turn things on its head mm. for us. And uh, so that's my two cents on that. And then just finally um, on the last one, I just think what we'll get, we'll see a lot more is um, strategic advice. And that's sort of like when when I say that, I mean advice over over someone's lifetime and um, just. <laughs> more of taking in the whole person, the whole situation over their whole lifetime. And so, you know, it, it'll be just it'll lift and be more strategic and I think we'll see see a lot more of that uh, in the future. Cool. Advice B and B, I think that's the that's what we're looking for. Hey look, thank you so much Ange, Jonathan, Tim and Craig uh, for spending the time today. Really great insights. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the next session up in here uh, is a second professional advice session, headwinds, tailwinds and navigating chains with the FAP Leaders Forum. So thank you very much and thank you very much. <laughs>